This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. And now, here's my conversation with Lisa Feldman Barrett. Since we'll talk a lot about the brain today, do you think, let's ask the craziest question, do you think there's other intelligent life out there in the universe? Honestly, I've been asking myself lately if there's intelligent life on this planet. Uh, You know, I I I have to think probabilities suggest yes, and also secretly I think I just hope that's true. It would be really... um, I know scientists aren't supposed to have hopes and dreams, but uh, I I think it would be really cool. And I also think it would be really sad if it if it wasn't the case. If we really were alone, that would be that that would seem profoundly. So for me, this counts. I think in the realm of awe, but also I think I'm somebody who cultivates awe deliberately on purpose to feel like a speck. You know, I I find it a relief occasionally. To feel small. To feel small in a profoundly large and interesting universe. So maybe to dig more technically on the question of intelligence, do you think it's difficult for intelligent life to arise like it did on Earth? from everything you've written and studied about the brain, how magical of a thing is it in terms of the odds it takes to arise? Yeah, so, you know, magic is just... <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I, like a, I like a magic show as much as the next person. Yeah. I, my husband was a magician uh, at one time. But uh, you know, magic is just a bunch of stuff that we don't really understand how it works yet. So I would say, from what I understand, there are some major steps in the course. Could it, you know, what's the likelihood that it would happen again as much as um, what are the steps and how long would it take? And if it were to happen again on Earth, would would we end up with the same, you know, menu of life forms that we currently have now? And I think the answer is probably no, right? There's just so much about evolution that is stochastic and driven by chance. But the question is whether that menu would be equally delicious, meaning like there'd be rich complexity of the kind of, like, would we get dolphins and humans or whoever else falls in that category. ...of creatures who've gone extinct. I mean, right. if you look at the range of creatures that are, are on the Earth now, it's incredible. And, you know, it's sort of tried to say that, but it actually is really incredible. Um, particularly, I don't know, I mean, animals, there are animals that seem really ordinary until you watch them closely and then they become miraculous, you know, like certain types of birds, which do very miraculous things, uh, um, build, you know, bowers and do dances and all these really funky things that are hard to explain uh, with a standard evolutionary story. Although, you know, um, people have them. Birds are weird. They do a lot of, for mating purposes, They, they have a concept of beauty well, I haven't quite, maybe you know much better, but it doesn't seem to fit evolutionary arguments well. It does fit. It, well, it but. depends, right? So I think you're talking about the evolution of beauty, the um, book that was written recently by, was it from, um, was that his name? Richard Frum, I think, at oh, Yale. Interesting. No, I didn't. Uh, oh, it's a great book. It's very controversial, though, because he is argue, he's making the argument that the, the question about birds and some other animals is why would they 
engage in such metabolically costly um, displays when it doesn't improve their fitness at all? And the answer that he gives is the answer that Darwin gave, which is sexual selection. Um, not natural selection, but you know, selection can occur for all kinds of reasons. There could be artificial selection, which is when we breed animals, right? Which is actually how Darwin that that observation helped Darwin come to the idea of natural selection. Oh, interesting. Um, and then there's sexual selection, um, meaning, and the argument that that um, I think his name is from uh, makes is that um, that it's the. <laughs> peek into the oh, yeah. sky, there are miraculous creatures, look at creatures who've gone extinct. And, you, you know, in science fiction uh, stories, you couldn't dream up something as interesting. So my guess is that, you know, intelligent life evolves in, in many different ways, even on this planet. Uh, there isn't one form of intelligence. There's not one brain that gives you intelligence. There are lots of different brain structures that can give you intelligence. So my guess is that the menagerie might not look exactly the way that it looks now, but it would certainly be as as interesting. But if we look at uh, the human brain versus the brains, or whatever you call them, the mechanisms of intelligence in our ancestors, even early ancestors, that you write about, for example, in your in your new book. <laughs> So what's the interesting comparison, would you say? Well, first of all, I wouldn't say that the human brain is the fanciest brain we've got. I mean, an octopus brain is pretty different and pretty fancy, and they can do some pretty amazing things that we cannot do. You know, we can't grow back limbs. We can't change color and texture. We can't comport ourselves and squeeze ourselves into a little crevice. I mean, these are things that we invent. These are like superhero abilities that we invent in stories, right? We can't do any of those things. And so the human brain is certainly, um, we can certainly do some things that other animals can't do um, that seem pretty impressive. Connects all brains uh, together in terms of homeostasis and all that kind of stuff. I Yeah, I wouldn't say that the that the human brain is any less miraculous than anybody else would say. I just think that there are other brain structures which are also miraculous. And I also think that there are a number of things about the human brain which we share with other other vertebrates, other animals with backbones, but um, that are that we share these miraculous things. But we can do some things in abundance. And we can also do some things with our brains together, working together that other animals can't do, or at least we haven't discovered their ability to do it. Yeah, this social thing. How? I mean, that's one of the things you write about. Uh, what's? Uh, how do you make sense of the fact, uh, like the book *Sapiens* and? The fact that we're able to kind of connect, like network our brains together, like you write about, I'll try, I'll try to stop saying that. <laughs> uh, is that, is that like some kind of feature that's built into there? Is that unique to our human brains? Like, how do you make sense of that? What I would say is that our ability to coordinate with each other is not unique. Um, to humans. There are lots of animals uh, wh who can do that. And we, um, but what we do with that coordination is unique because of some of the structural features in our brains. And it's not that anim other animals don't have those structural features, it's we have them in abundance. Mm. So, you know, the human brain is not larger than you would expect it to be for a primate of our size. If you took a, a chimpanzee and you ex you grew it to a, a, the size of a human, that chimpanzee would have a brain that was the size of a human brain. 
So there's nothing special about our brain in terms of its size. There's nothing special about our brain in terms of the, um, the basic blueprint that builds our brain from an embryo is the basic blueprint that builds all mammalian. This stuff happens? Well, no, it really isn't. And I will also say that lots of clever stuff happens in animals who don't have a cerebral cortex. But, right. um, but, uh, but because of the size of the cerebral cortex and because of some of the features that are enhanced by that size, that gives us the capacity to do things like build civilizations um, and coordinate with each other, not just to manipulate the physical world, but to add to it in very profound ways. Like, you know, other animals can cooperate with each other and use tools. Um, we draw a line in the sand and we make countries and we even, then we create, you know, uh, well, we create citizens and immigrants. But also ideas. I mean, the well, countries are centered around the concept of like ideas. It's, well, my, well, what do you think a citizen is and, and an immigrant? In our, in our brains. So the, this kind of network that you talk about of brains is just a little canvas for ideas to then yeah, compete against I, each other and so on. I, I think as a rhetorical tool, it's cool to uh, think, you know, think that way. So um, I think it was Michael Pollan. I don't remember if it was in The Botany of Desire, but it was in one of his early books on um, on um, botany and gardening where he uh, wrote about, um, and uh, he wrote about, uh, you know, plants e e sort of utilizing humans for their own, you know, uh, yeah. evolutionary purposes, which yeah. is kind of interesting. You can think about a human gut in a sense as a, a propagation device for the seeds of, right. you know, tomatoes and what, what have you. So it's kind of cool. Um, so I think, I think rhetorically, it's an interesting device, but, you know, ideas are, as far as I know, um, invented by humans, propagated by humans. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think they're separate from human brains in, in any way, although it, it would it is interesting to, to think about it that way. Well, of course, the idea is that are conducive to certain sets of ideas, and maybe those ideas will win out. Yeah, I think the way that I would say it really, though, is that there are many species of animals that influence each other's nervous systems, that regulate each other's nervous systems. And they mainly do it by physical means. They do it by chemicals, scent. They do it by, you know, so so termites and ants and bees, for example, use chemical scents. Mammals like um, like rodents use scent and they also use uh, hearing, audition, and that little bit of vision. Um, primates, you know, non-human primates add vision, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and um, I think everybody uses touch. Humans, as far as I know, are the only species that use ideas and words yeah, to pleasure. regulate each other, right? I can text something to someone halfway around the world. That's fascinating. They don't have to hear my voice. Yeah. They don't have to see my face. And I can have an effect on their nervous system. And ideas, the ideas that we communicate with words... I mean, words are, in a sense, a way for us to do mental telepathy with mm -hmm. each other, right? I mean, I'm not the first person to say that, obviously. But how do I control your heart rate? How do I control your breathing? How do I control your actions with words? It's because those words are communicating ideas. So you also write, I think, let's go back to the brain. You write that Plato gave us the idea that the human brain has three brains in it, three forces, uh, which is kind of a compelling notion. Uh, you disagree. First of all, what are the three parts of the brain and uh, why do you disagree? So Plato's description of the psyche 
which for the moment we'll just assume is the same as a mind. There are some scholars who would say, you know, a soul, a psyche, a mind, those aren't actually all the same thing in ancient Greece, but we'll just for now gloss over that. So Plato's idea was that, and it was a, it was a description of really about moral behavior and moral responsibility in humans. So the idea was that, you know, the human psyche can be described with a um, uh, metaphor of two horses and a charioteer. So one horse for instincts, um, like um, feeding and fighting and fleeing and uh, reproduction. I'm trying to control my salty language. <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> which apparently they print in England. Like I actually tossed off a fairly... What, which, F, S? Yeah, which F, one? F. Uh, okay. F, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was like, you printed that. I couldn't believe you printed that. <laughs> Without like the stars <laughs> there, or whatever? No, no, no. There was full print. Okay, yeah. They great. also printed the a B word and it was really wow. quite... Yeah. Well, anyways. We should, <laughs> we should, we should uh, learn something from England. Indeed. Anyways, but instincts. And then the other horse represents emotions. Uh, and then the charioteer represents rationality, which controls, you know, the two beasts. Like a lizard, an inner lizard brain uh, for instincts. And then wrapped around that evolved... On, layer on top of that evolved a limbic system for uh, in mammals. So the, the novelty was in a mammalian brain, which uh, bestowed mammals with, uh, gave them emotions, the capacity for emotions. And then um, uh, on top of that uh, evolved uh, a cerebral cortex, um, which in, in largely in primates, but but um, very large in in humans, um, and it's not that I personally disagree. It's that as far back as the 1960s, but really by the 1970s, it was shown pretty clearly with, with evidence from molecular genetics. So peering into cells in the brain to look at the molecular makeup of genes that the brain did not evolve that way. And the irony hmm. is that, um, you know, the, the idea of the, the three-layered brain with an inner lizard, you know, that hijacks your, uh, hijacks your behavior and causes you to do and say things that uh, you would otherwise not or maybe that you will regret later, that idea... Um, became very popular, was popularized by uh, Carl Sagan in uh, The Dragons of Eden, which won a Pulitzer Prize in 1977, when it was already known pretty much in evolutionary neuroscience that the whole uh, narrative was a myth. So, well, the narrative is on the, the way it evolved, but do you, I mean, again, it's that problem of... Uh, it being a useful tool of conversation to say like there's a lizard brain and there's a like if i get overly emotional on twitter that was the lizard brain and so on uh but do you no so, i don't think it's useful i but, think it's a i think that but is it is is it uh is it useful is it accurate i don't think it's accurate and therefore i don't think it's useful got it so I, here's what I would say. You know, I think that um, the way I think about philosophy and science is that they are useful tools for living. And in order to be useful tools for living, they have to help you make good decisions. The triune brain, as it's called, this this three layer brain, the idea that your brain is like an already baked cake, and uh, you know the cortex, cerebral cortex, is just layered on top like icing. Mm -hmm. um, the idea, that idea, is the foundation of uh, the law in most Western countries. It's the foundation of uh, economic theory, and 
it large and it's a great narrative. It sort of fits our intuitions about how we work. But it also, um, it's in addition to being wrong, it lets people off the hook for right. uh, for nasty behavior, you know. Um, and it also suggests that emotions can't be a source of wisdom, which they often are. Um, in fact, you you would right. not want to be around someone who didn't have emotions. That would be that's a psychopath. Right. I mean, that's not someone you you know want to want to really uh, have have that person deciding your outcome. So I guess my, and I could sort of go on and on and on, but my point is that um, I don't think, I don't think it's a useful narrative in the end. What's the more accurate view of the brain that we should use when we're thinking about it? I'll answer that in a second, but I'll say that even our notion of what an instinct is or what a reflex is, is not quite right. Right. So if you look at evidence from um, ecology, for example, and you look at animals in their ecological context, what you can see is that even things which are reflexes are very context sensitive. Um, the, the brains of those animals are executing so-called instinctual actions in a very, very context sensitive way. And so you know, even when a physician, you know, takes the, you know, it's like the idea of your patellar uh, reflex where they hit, you know, your patellar tendon on your knee and you you kick. The the force with which you kick and so on in, is influenced by all kinds of things. It's is the way that um, matches our best understanding, our best scientific understanding, which I think is really cool uh, because it's really counterintuitive. So how I came to this view, and it's, I'm certainly not the only one who holds this view, I was reading work in on neuroanatomy and the, the view that I'm about to tell you was sugge strongly suggested by that. And then I was reading work in signal processing, like by engi you know, electrical engineering. And similarly, it, the work suggested that the that the research suggested that the brain worked this way. And I'll just say that I was reading across multiple literatures and they were who don't speak to each other. And they were all pointing in this direction. And so far, although some of the details are still up for grabs, the general gist, I think, is I've not come across anything yet, which really violates, and I'm looking, mm -hmm. um, and so the idea is something like this. It's very counterintuitive. Um, so the way to describe it is to say that your brain doesn't react to things in the world. It's not, it, to us, it feels like our eyes and our, um, our windows on the world. We see things, we hear things, we, we react to them. Um, in psychology, we call this stimulus response. So um, your face is, a, your voice is a stimulus to me. I receive input and then I react to it. Uh, and I might react very automatically, you know, system one. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, oh, but I also might ex execute some control where I maybe stop myself from saying something or doing something and um, more in a more reflective way execute a different action, right? That's system two. The way the brain works, though, is it's predicting all the time. It's constantly talking to itself, constantly uh, talking to your body, uh, and it's constantly um, predicting what's going on in the body and what's going on in the world and making predictions. And um, the information from your body and from the world really confirm or correct those predictions. So fundamentally, the thing that the brain does most of the time is just predict, like talking to itself and predicting stuff about the world, not like this dumb thing that just senses and responds, senses and yeah, responds. Yeah, so the way, to, the way to think about it is like this. You know, your brain is uh, trapped in a dark, silent box. Yeah, that's very romantic of you. 
um, which is your skull. And the only information that it receives from your body and from the world, right, is through the senses, through the sense organs, your eyes, your ears, and um, you have uh, sense, sensory data that comes from your body uh, that you're largely unaware of uh, to your brain, which we call interoceptive, as opposed to exteroceptive, which is the world around you. And, but your brain is receiving sense data continuously, which are the effect of some set of causes. Your brain doesn't know the cause of these sense data. It's only receiving the effects of those causes, which are the data themselves. And so your brain has to solve what philosophers call an inverse inference problem. How do you know, when you only receive the effects of something, how do you know what caused those effects? So when there's a flash of light or um, a change in air pressure... Or past experiences, and it can combine those past experiences in novel ways. And so we have lots of names for this in psychology. We call it memory. We call it perceptual inference. We call it simulation. Um, uh, it's also, we call it concepts or conceptual knowledge. We call it prediction. Basically, if we were to stop the world right now, stop time, your brain is in a state and it's representing what it believes is going on in your body and in the world. And it's predicting what will happen next based on past experience, right? Probabilistically, what's most likely to happen. And it begins to um, prepare your action and it begins to prepare your the it, prepare your experience based so it's anticipating the sense data it's going to receive and then when that those data come in they either confirm that prediction and your action executes because the plan's already been made mm -hmm. or um it uh or there's some uh sense data that your brain didn't predict that's unexpected, and your brain takes it in, we say encodes it. We have a fancy name for that. We call it learning. Your brain learns, and it updates its uh, storehouse of knowledge, which we call an internal model, and uh, that you so that you can predict better next time. And it turns out that predicting and correcting, predicting and correcting is a much more metabolically efficient way to run a system than constantly reacting all the time. Because if you're constantly reacting, it means you have no, you can't anticipate in any way what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so the, the amount of uncertainty that you have to deal with is uh, overwhelming to a nervous system. Metabolically costly, I like it. <laughs> and so what is a reflex? A reflex is when your brain doesn't check against the sense data, that the uh. potential cost to you is so great, maybe because you know your life is threatened, that your brain makes the prediction and executes the action without checking. Yeah, so but prediction is still at the core. That's a beautiful vision of the brain. I wonder from almost an AI perspective, but just computationally, is the brain just mostly a prediction machine then? Like is the perception just the nice little feature added on top like the both the the integration of new perceptual information i wonder how big of, of an impressive system is that relative to just the big predictor model constructor well i think that we can we can look to evolution for that for one answer which is that when you go back you know 550 million years give or take we, you know, the world was populated by creatures, really ruled by creatures without brains. Um, and, um, you know, that's a biological statement, not a 
political statement. <laughs> so like, ruled with creatures. You calling without... dinosaurs dumb? You're talking about like. Oh no, I'm not talking about dinosaurs, honey. Yeah. I'm talking way back, way. further back than that. Um, yeah. Really, these there are these little little um, creatures called uh, Amphioxus, which is the modern. It's a or a lancet. That's the modern animal, but it's an animal that scientists believe is very similar to um, our common, the common ancestor that we share uh, with invertebrates um, because, uh, be basically because of uh, the tracing back the molecular genetics in cells. It had an eye spot for, um, not for seeing, but just for um, in training to circadian rhythm to light and dark. Um, and it had no hearing. It had a vestibular cell so that it could keep upright in the water. At the time, we're talking evolutionary scale here, so, you know, give or take some hundred million years or something. But at the time, you know, what are the vertebrate, like when a, when a backbone evolved and a brain evolved, a full brain, that was when a head evolved with sense, with sense organs and when... Um, that's when your viscera, like internal systems involved. So the answer I would say is that, um, that senses, nurse, motor neuroscientists, people who study the control of motor behavior, basically, and, you know, and the answer that um, is, you know, commonly entertained right now is that it was predation. That when, at some point, an a an animal evolved that deliberately ate another animal, and this launched an arms race between predators and prey, and it became very useful to have senses, right? So these these little amphiox these little amphioxy, it, it, you know, don't really have the they don't have an, they're not aware of their environment very much, really. They, um, uh, and so being able to look up ahead and, you know, ask yourself, you know, is that, you know, should I eat that or will it eat me um, is, is a very useful thing. So the idea um, is that sense, sense, Sense data is not there for consciousness. It didn't evolve for the purposes of consciousness. It didn't evolve for the purposes of experiencing anything. Um, it evolved uh, in the to be in the service of motor control. However, maybe it's useful. Um, this is why you know scientists sometimes uh, avoid questions about why things evolved, that this is what philosophers call this teleology. You might be able to say something about how uh, things evolve, but not necessarily why. We don't really know the why. Uh, that's all speculation. But the why is kind of nice here. This, the interesting thing is uh, that was the first element of social interaction is, am I going to eat you or are you going to eat me? And for that, it's useful to be able to see each other, sense each other. Uh, that's kind of fascinating that, that there was a time when life didn't eat each other. <laughs> or they did by accident, right? So an amphioxus, right. for example, will, um, it kind of like gyrates in the water and then it plants itself in the sand, like a blade of, like a living blade of grass, yeah. and then it just filters yeah. uh, whatever comes into its mouth, right? So it is, it is eating, but it's not actively hunting. hunting. And when um, the concentration of food decreases, it, the amphioxus can sense this. And so it basically wriggles itself randomly to some other spot, which pr probabilistically will have more food than wherever it is. So it's not really, you know, it's not guiding its actions um, on the basis of, it's not, we would say there's no real intentional action um, in that, in that, in the traditional sense. 
Speaking of intentional action, and if the brain is, if prediction is indeed a core component of the brain, let me ask you a question that scientists also hate is uh, about free will. So <laughs> how does, uh, do you think about free will much? How, how does that fit into this, into your view of the brain? Why does it feel like we make decisions in this world? This is a hard. It, we scientists hate this because it's a hard. It's a hard yeah. question. We don't have the have answer. Have you taken to. a side? I think <laughs> Do I have, have free will. I think I have taken a side, but it, it. I don't put a lot of stock in my own intuitions or anybody's intuitions about the cause of things. Right. Our exp one thing we know about right. the brain for sure is that the brain creates experiences for us. Our my brain creates experiences for me. Your brain creates experiences for you in a way that lures you to believe that those experiences actually reveals the way that it works, right. but it doesn't. So, the so you don't trust your own intuition about not about really, free will. <laughs> not really. No, I mean no, but but I am also somewhat persuaded by you know I think Dan Dennett wrote at at one point like um, uh, you know the philosopher Dan Dennett wrote at one point that um, it it's, I, I can't say it as eloquently as him, but it people obviously have free will. They are obviously making choices. So it's, you know, and so. Last thing. Yeah, I think we did it just like that, actually. So bravo. Wow. Yeah. I have to go look, look back to the tape. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> the, um, the idea though, <laughs> is that your brain is using past experience and it can and it can use past experience in um so it's remembering but you're not consciously remembering it's basically re-implementing prior experiences as a way of predicting what's going to happen next right. and it can do something called conceptual combination which is it can take bits and pieces of the past and combine it in new ways so you can experience and make sense of things that you've never encountered before because you've encountered something similar to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so a brain, in a sense, is not um, just, um, doesn't just contain information, it is information gaining, meaning it can create it new information by this generative process. So in a sense, you could say, well, that maybe that's that's a source of free will. But I think really where free will comes from, or the kind of free will that I think is worth having a conversation about, is um, involves cultivating experiences for yourself that change your internal model. When you were born and you were raised in a particular context, that your mod your brain wired itself to your surroundings to your physical surroundings and also to your social surroundings so you were handed an internal model basically um, but uh, when you grow up the more control you have over your where you are and what you do um, you can cultivate new experiences for yourself and those new experiences uh, can change your internal model. And you can actually um, practice those experiences in a way. Effects of the billions of decisions you make early on in life have are so great that uh, even if it's not even if it's like all deterministic, just the amount of possibilities that are created and then the focusing of those possibilities into a single trajectory, uh, that s somewhere within that, that's free will. Even if it's all deterministic, that might as well be of just the number of choices that are possible and the fact that you just make one trajectory through those set of choices seems to be like something like they'll be called free will. But it's still kind of sad to think like there doesn't seem to be a place where there's magic in there, where it is all just the computer. 
Well, there's lots of magic, I would say, so far, because we don't really understand uh, how all of this is exactly played out at a, uh, I mean, scientists are working hard and disagree about some of the details under the hood of what I just described, but I think there's quite a bit of magic, actually. And also there's there's also um, stochastic firing of neur neurons don't, they, they're not purely digital in the sense that there is, there's also analog communication between neurons, not just digital. So it's not just with, not just with firing of, of axons. And some of that, uh, they, there's there are other ways to communicate, and also um, uh, there's noise. Brain to be able to be information bearing. So um, basically, you know, there are some animals that have n clusters of cells. The only job is to inject noise. <laughs> Uh, you know, into their um, neural patterns. So maybe noise is the source of free will. So you could think about <laughs> yeah. you can think about stochasticity or noise as as a source of free free will, or you can think of, of um, conceptual combination as a, a source of free will. You can certainly think about um, cultivating. Uh, you know, you can't reach back into your past and change your past. You know, people try by psychotherapy and so on, but what you can do is change your present, um, which becomes your past. Um, well, let me, let right? me think so, about that sentence. <laughs> uh, so one way to think about it is that you're continuously, this is a, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine said, so what you're saying is that people are continually cultivating their past. And I was like, that's very poetic. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> P you are continually cultivating your past as a means of controlling your future. So you think, uh, yeah, I guess the, the construction of the mental model that you use for prediction ultimately contains within it your perception of the past, like the way you interpret the past, or even just the entirety of your narrative about the past. So you're constantly rewriting the story of your past. Oh boy, yeah. That's one poetic and also just awe-inspiring. What about the other thing you talk about? You've mentioned real at all. Like how do we know it's real? How do we make sense of the fact that, just like you said, there's this brain sitting alone in the darkness trying to perceive the world. How do we know that the world is out there I, to be perceived? Yeah, so I don't think that you should be asking questions like that without yeah. passing a joint. Right, no, for sure. Yeah. I but actually did here, before th this, so I apologize. Okay, yeah. no, well, that's okay. For You apologize <laughs> for not sharing. That's yeah. okay. So, I mean, here's what I would say. What I would say is that the reason why we can be pretty sure that there's a there there is that the, the structure of the information in the world, what we call statistical regularities in sights and sounds and so on, the world. And it must receive those wiring instructions to develop in a typical way. So for example, when a newborn is born, when a newborn is born, when a, when a baby is born, um, the baby can't see very well because the visual system in that baby's brain is not complete. The the retina of your eye, which actually is part of your brain, has to be stimulated with photons of light. If it's not, the baby won't develop normally the, to be able to see in, the, in a neurotypical way. Same thing is true for hearing. The same thing is true really for all your senses. So the point is that, um, that the physical world, the sense data from the physical world wires your brain so that you have an internal model of that world so that your brain can predict well to keep you alive and well and allow you to thrive. 
that's fascinating that the brain is waiting for a very specific kind of uh, set of instructions from the world. Like not not the specific, but a very specific kind of instructions. Yeah. So you scientists call it expectable input. The right. brain needs some input in order to develop normally. And yeah. so we're and we are genetically, you know, we as I say in the book, we we have the kind of nature that requires nurture. Mm. We we can't develop normally without sense input, sensory input from the world and from the body. And what's really interesting about humans and some other animals too, but really seriously in humans, is the input that we need is not just normally that infant needs eye contact, touch, it needs certain types of smells, it needs to be cuddled, it needs, right? So, um, Without social input, the brain, it's that that infant's brain will not wire itself in a neurotypical way. And again, I would say that there are lots of um, whatever the social environment is for an infant, um, that it will will be reflected in that infant's. Um, internal model. So we have lots of different cultures, lots of different ways of rearing children. Um, and that's an advantage for our species, although we don't always experience it that way. That is an advantage for our species. Um, but if you, if you just, you know, feed and water a baby without all the extra social doodads, um, what you get is a profoundly impaired uh, human. Yeah, but nevertheless, you're kind of saying that the physical reality has a has a consistent thing throughout that keeps feeding these uh, set of sensory information that our brains are constructed for. But yeah, the cool thing though is that if you change the consistency, if you change the statistical regularities, so prediction error your brain can learn it. It's expensive for your brain to learn it. And it takes a while to, to for the brain to get really automated with it. And we spend most of our day on Twitter and TikTok. Like, I wonder what, where the breaking point, is, like the limitations of the brain's capacity to, uh, to, to properly continue wiring itself. Well, I think what I would say is that there are different ways to specify your question, right? Like one way to specify it would be the way that David um, phrases it, which is, can we can we create a new sense? Like, can, right. can we create n a new sensory modality? Um, how hard would that be? What are the limits in doing that? Um, and um, but another way to um, say it is what what happens to a brain when you remove some of those statistical regularities, right? Like what happens to a brain? What happens to an adult brain when you remove some of the statistical patterns that were there and they're not there anymore? Are you talking about in the environment or in the actual like you remove eyesight, for example, or do, do... well, either way. I mean, basically. One way to limit the inputs to your brain are to stay home and um, right. protect yourself. I see, yeah. Another way is to put someone in um, solitary confinement. Another way is to stick them uh, in a nursing home. Another, well, not all nursing homes, but, you know, right. bef but there are some, right, which really are so where people, people are somewhat impoverished in the interactions and the sensory, st the variety. You know, you, um, variety is a good thing um, for a brain. And um, uh, there are risks that you take uh, when you restrict uh, what you expose yourself to. Yeah. 
you know, there's all this talk of diversity. The brain loves it to the fullest de definition and degree of diversity. Yeah, I mean, That's I would say the only thing, basically human brains thrive on diversity. The only place where we seem to have difficulty with diversity is with each other. <laughs> Yeah. Right. But we, who wants to eat the same food every day? You yeah. never would. Who wants to wear the same clothes every day? I mean, yeah. my husband, if you ask him to close his eyes, he won't be able to tell you what he's wearing. Yeah. He just, right. He'll buy seven shirts of exactly the same style in yeah. different colors, but they are in different colors, right? It's not well, like he's well, wearing. How would you then explain my brain, which is terrified of choice and therefore I wear the same thing every time? Well, you must be getting your diversity. Elsewhere. Well, first of all, you are a fairly sharp dresser, so there is that. <laughs> but um, so you're getting some reinforcement for yeah. dressing the way that you do. But no, well, your brain must get diversity in, 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 other other, in other places. But I think we, you know, the, the, so there, the two most expensive things your brain can do, metabolically speaking, is, um, is move your body um, and uh, learn something new. So novelty, that is diversity, right, co comes at a cost, a metabolic cost, but it's a cost, it's an investment that, that gives returns. And in general, people vary in how much they like novelty, unexpected things. Some people really like it, some people really don't like it, and there's everybody in between. But in general, um, we don't eat the same thing every day, we don't usually do exactly the same thing in exactly the same order, in exactly the same place every day. Um, the only place we have difficulty uh, with diversity in, is in each other. <laughs> and then we, we have considerable problems there, I would say, as a species. Let me ask, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Donald Hoffman's work about this uh, questions of reality. Um, what what are your thoughts of the possibility that the very thing we've been talking about of the brain wiring itself from birth to a particular set of inputs is just a little slice of reality? That there is something much bigger out there that we humans with our cognition, cognitive capabilities is just not even perceiving. That uh, the thing we're perceiving is just the crappy like windows 95 interface onto a much bigger richer set of complex physics that we're not even in touch with well without getting too metaphysical about it i think we know for sure it doesn't have to be the you know crappy version of anything but we definitely have a limited we have, we have a set of senses that are limited in very physical ways, and we're clearly not perceiving everything there is to perceive. That's clear. I mean, it's just, it's not that hard. We can't, without special, why do we invent scientific tools? It's so that we can overcome our senses and, and experience things that we couldn't otherwise, right. whether they are, you know, different parts of the uh, visual spectrum, you know, the light spectrum or um, things that are too microscopically s small for us to see or too far away for us to see. Um, so clearly we're only getting a slice. Um, and that slice, you know, the, the interesting or potentially sad thing about humans is that we whatever we experience, we think there's a natural reason for experiencing it. Mm -hmm. And we think it's obvious and natural and that it must be this way. And that all the other stuff isn't important. And that's clearly not true. Many of the things that we think of as natural are anything but, we've cre they're certainly real, but we've created them. Um, they certainly have very real impacts, but we've created those impacts. And we also know that there are many things outside of our awareness that have a, have tremendous influence on what we experience and what we do. So there's no question that that's true. I mean, just it's it's um, but the, but the extent is how fantastic. You know, yeah, really, exactly. the question is how fantastical is it? Yeah, like what you know, a lot of people ask me. I've. Uh, my 
did I do next? What did I feel next? What did I see next? And so it doesn't come up with one answer. It comes up with a distribution of it, possible answers. And then there has to be some selection process. And so you have a, a network in your brain, a sub-network in your brain, a, a population of neurons that helps to choose. It's not, I'm not talking about a homunculus in your brain or anything silly like that. Um, uh, this is not the soul. It's not the center of yourself or anything like that. But there is um, it, uh, uh, a set of neurons that weighs the probabilities uh, um, um, and, and helps to select uh, or narrow the field. Okay. And that, that network is working all the time. It's actually called the control network, the executive control network, or you can call it a frontoparietal because the regions of the brain that make it up are in the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. There are also parts that belong to the subcortical parts of your brain. It doesn't really matter. The point is that, that there is this network and it is working all the time. Whether or not you feel in control, whether or not you feel like you're expending effort doesn't really matter. It's on all the time, except when you sleep. When you sleep, it's it's a little bit relaxed. <laughs> and so think about what's happening when you sleep. When you sleep, the exter the external world recedes, the sense data from so basically your model becomes a little bit the tethers from the world are loosened. And this network, which is involved in, you know, maybe weeding out unrealistic things is a little bit quiet. So you, your dreams are really your internal model that's unconstrained by the immediate world. Except, so you can do things that you can't do in real life in your dreams, right? You can fly. Like I, for example, when I fly on my back in a dream, I'm much faster than when I fly on my front. Don't ask me why. I don't know. But when you're laying on your back in your dream? No. When I'm in my dream and flying in a dream, I am much faster flyer in the air. Fly often? Mm, not often, you, but you, I... You talk about it like you fly. I don't think I've flown for many years. Well, you must try it. I've, I've, fa I've uh, flown... Uh, I've fallen... That's scary. Yeah, but yeah. you fly. You're talking about like yeah. I airplane. fly. I fly my dreams, oh, that's and I'm way faster, right? On your back. On my back, way faster. Um, now you can say, well, you know, you never flew in your life, right? It's conceptual combination. I mean, I've flown in an airplane, and I've seen birds fly, and I've watched movies of people flying, and I know Superman probably flies. I don't know if he flies faster on his back, but he's well, he's out of never always seen flying on his front, front right? But so. yeah, but anyways, my point is that you know all of this stuff really, um, all these experiences really become part of your internal model. The thing is that when you're asleep, your internal model is still being constrained by your body. Your your brain's always attached to your body. It's always receiving sense data from your body. You're mostly never aware of it uh, unless you run up the stairs uh, or, or, you know, uh, maybe you um, are ill in some way. But you're mostly not aware of it, which is a really good thing because if you were, you, you know, you'd never pay attention to anything outside your own skin ever again. Like right now, you seem like you're sitting there very calmly, but you have a, a virtual whole thing going drama, on. right? Yeah. It's like a like yeah. a like an opera going yeah. on inside your body. And so I think that one of the things that happens when people um, take psilocybin or take uh, you know ketamine, for example, is that the tethers <laughs> are completely removed. Are completely removed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. And then, but and and that's yeah. why it's helpful to have a guide, right? Because the guide is giving you sense data to steer that internal model so that it doesn't go completely off the rails. Yeah, no, there's so again that wiring to the other brain. That's the guide is at least a tiny little tether. Exactly. Yeah, let's talk about emotion. 
a little bit if we could. Emotion comes up often, and I have never spoken with anybody who um, who has a clarity about emotion from a biological and neuroscience perspective that you do. And I'm not sure I fully know how to, as a, as a, I mentioned this way too much, but as somebody who was born in the Soviet Union and romanticizes basically everything, talks about love nonstop, you know, emotion is a, I don't know what to make of it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what, to, I, I, so maybe uh, let's just try to talk about it. I mean, from a neuroscience perspective, we talked about it a little bit last time, your book covers it, how emotions are made, but what are some misconceptions we writers of poetry, we romanticizing humans have about emotion that we should uh, move away from if we were to think about emotion from both a scientific and an engineering perspective? Yeah, so there is a common view of emotion in the West the caricature of that view is that, um, you know, we have an inner beast, right? Your limbic system, your your inner lizard. Um, we have an inner beast and that comes baked in to the brain at birth. So you've got circuits for anger, sadness, fear. It's interesting that they all have English names, these circuits. Are. Yeah. But um, the... the and they're there and they're triggered by things in the world. And um, then they cause you to do and say, and th you know, so when your fear circuit is triggered, you widen your eyes, you um, gasp, your, uh, your heart rate goes up, you prepare to flee or um, uh, to freeze. Um, and these are these are modal responses. They're not the only responses that you give, but on average, they're the prototypical responses. That's the view. And um, that's the view of emotion in the law. That's the view, um, you know, that emotions are these profoundly unhelpful things that are obligatory kind of like reflexes. Um, the problem with that view is that it doesn't comport to the evidence. Um, and it doesn't really matter. The evidence actually lines up beautifully with each other. It just doesn't line up with that view. And it doesn't matter whether you're measuring people's faces, facial movements, or you're measuring their body movements, or you're measuring their peripheral physiology, or you're measuring their brains, or their voices, or whatever. Pick any any um, output that you want to measure and, you know, any system you want to measure, and you don't really find strong evidence for this. And I say this as somebody who, who not only has reviewed really thousands of articles and run, you know, big meta analyses, which are statistical summaries of, of published papers, but also as someone who has sent teams of researchers to um, small scale uh, cultures uh, you know, remote cultures, which are very different from uh, urban uh, large-scale cultures like ours. Um, and one culture that we visited, and I say we euphemistically because I, I myself didn't go because I only had two research permits and I gave them to my students because I felt like it was better for them to have that experience and more formative for them to have that. Very similar, in similar conditions to our ancestors, uh, uh, hunting gathering ancestors, uh, when expressions of emotion were supposed to have evolved, mm -hmm. at least by one view of, okay. So, you know, for many years, I was sort of struggling with um, this set of observations, right? Which is that I feel emotion and I see, I perceive emotion in other people, but scientists can't find a single marker, a single biomarker, not a single individual measure or pattern of measures that will can predict how someone, what kind of emotional state they're in. 
Mm. How could that possibly be? How, how can you possibly make sense of those two things? And through a lot of reading and a lot of and immersing myself in different literatures, I came to the hypothesis that the brain is constructing these instances out of more basic ingredients. So when I tell you that the brain, when I suggest to you that what your brain is doing is making a prediction and it's asking itself, figuratively speaking, the last time I was in this situation and th this you know, physical state, what did I do next? What did I see next? What did I hear next? It's basically asking what in my past is similar to the present. Mm -hmm. Things which are similar to one another are called a category. A group of things which are similar to one another is a category. And a mental representation of a category is a concept. So your brain is constructing categories or concepts on the fly continuously. So you really want to understand what a brain is doing. You don't using machine learning like classification models is not going to help you because the brain doesn't classify. It's doing category construction. Mm -hmm. And the categories change, or, or you could say it's doing concept construction. It's using past experience to conjure a concept, which is a prediction. Mm -hmm. And if it's using past experiences of emotion, then it's constructing an emotion concept. Your concept will be the content of it is, is um, changes depending on the situation that you're in. So, for example, if your brain uses past experiences of anger that you have learned, either because somebody labeled them for you, taught them to you, you observed them uh, in movies and so on, in one situation could be very different from your concept of for anger than another situation. And this is how anger, instances of anger, are what we call a population of variable instances. Sometimes when you're angry, you scowl. Sometimes when you're angry, you might smile. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you're angry, you might cry. Sometimes your heart rate will go up, it will go down, it will stay the same. It depends on what action you're about to take. Because the way prediction, and I should say, the idea that physiology is yoked to action is a very old idea in, in uh, the study of the peripheral nervous system that's been known for really decades. And so if you look at what the brain is doing, if you just look at the anatomy and, and you, what, here's the hypothesis that you would that you would come up with. And I can go into the details. I've published these details in, in scientific papers, and they also appear somewhat in um, How Emotions Are Made, my first book. They are not in the, you know, seven and a half lessons because that book is, is really not pitched at that level of explanation. Right. It's just giving, it's really just a set of little essays. Um, but the evidence... But what I'm about to say is actually based on, on, on scientific evidence. When your brain begins to make, form a prediction, the first thing it's doing is it's making a prediction of how to change the internal systems of your body, your heart, your cardiovascular system, the control of your heart, control of your lungs, right? a, a flush of, of cortisol, which is not a stress hormone. It's a hormone that gets glucose into your bloodstream very fast because your brain is predicting you need to do something metabolically um, uh, expensive. And so, so either that means either move or learn, mm -hmm. okay? And so your brain is preparing your body, the internal systems of your body, to execute some actions, to move in some way. And the, and then it infers based on those 
motor predictions and what we call visceromotor predictions, meaning the 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 changes in the viscera that your brain is preparing to um, to execute. Um, it, your brain makes an inference about what you will sense mm. based on those motor movements. So your experience of the world and your experience of your own body are a consequence of those predictions, those concepts. When your brain makes a concept for emotion, it's constructing an instance of that emotion. And that is how emotions are made. And those concepts load in. The predictions that are made include um, contents inside the body, contents outside the body. I mean, it includes other humans. So just this construction of a concept includes the variables that are much richer than just some sort of um, simple notion. Yeah, so our colloquial notion of a concept where, um, it, you know, um, where I say, well, what's a concept of a bird? And then you list a set of features off to me. That's that's people's understanding, you know, typically of what a concept is. But if you go uh, into the literature in um, cognitive science, what you'll see is that the way that scientists have understood what a concept is has really changed over the years. So people used to think about a concept as um, philosophers and scientists used to think about a concept as a dictionary definition for a category. For that category is a dictionary de definition of the features, right. the necessary and sufficient features right. of that of those instances. So for a bird, um, you know, it would be... Wings, feathers. Right, a beak. Yeah. It flies, whatever. Okay. Um, that's called the classical category. And scientists discovered, observed, that actually not all instances of birds have feathers and not all instances of birds fly. And so... The idea was that you don't have a single representation of necessary and sufficient features stored in your brain somewhere. Instead, what you have is a prototype. A prototype meaning um, you still have a single representation for the category, one. Um, but the features are like of the most typical instance of the category or maybe the most frequent instance, but not all instances of the category have all the features, right? They, right. they have some graded similarity to the prototype. And then, uh, you know, what, um, I'm gonna like incredibly simplify now a lot of work to say that then a series of experiments were done to show that, in fact, what your brain seems to be doing is coming up with a single exemplar or instance of the category and reading off the um, features when I ask you for the concept. So if we were in a pet store and I asked you what are the features of a bird, tell me the concept of bird, you would be more likely to give me features of a good pet. Mm -hmm. And if we were in a restaurant, you would be more likely, you know, like a budgie, right? Or, mm -hmm. or a canary. If we were in a restaurant, you would be more likely to give me the features of a bird that you would eat, like a chicken. Yeah. And if we were in a park, you'd be more... Mm -hmm. Sparrow or a robin, whereas if we were in South America, you would probably give me the features of a peacock, because that's more common, um, or it's or it is more common there than here that you would see a peacock in such circumstances. So, the idea was that really what your brain was doing was conjuring a concept on the fly that meets the function that the category is being put to, okay? Yep. Okay. Then 
people started studying ad hoc concepts, meaning um, concepts that where the instances don't share any any physical features, but the function of the instances are the same. So for example, think about all the things that can protect you from the rain. What are all the things that can protect you from the rain? Uh, umbrella, uh, sh like this apartment. Right. Uh. Even if they look different, sound different, smell different, this is called an abstract concept or a conceptual concept. Yeah. Now, the really cool thing about conceptual categories or conceptual cons or yes, yeah, conceptual category or conceptual as a category of things that are held together by a function, mm -hmm. which is called an abstract concept or a conceptual category, because the things don't share physical features, they share functional features. There are two really cool things about this. One is that's what Darwin said a species was. So Darwin is known for discovering natural selection. But the other thing he really did, which was really profound, which he's less celebrated for, is understanding that all biological categories have inherent variation. Inherent variation. Darwin wrote in The Origin of Species about, before Darwin's book, a species was thought to be a classical category where all the instances of dogs were the same, had the exactly same features, and any variation from that uh, perfect pl platonic uh, instance was considered to be error. And Darwin said, no, it's not error. It's meaningful. Nature selects on the basis of that variation. The reason why natural selection is, is powerful and can exist is because there is variation in a species. And in dogs, we talk about that variation in terms of the size of the dog and the uh, amount of fur the dog has and the color and the, how long is the tail and how long is the snout. In humans, we talk about that variation in all kinds of ways, right? Including in cultural ways. So that's one thing that's really interesting about conceptual categories is that Darwin was basically saying a species is a conceptual category. Yeah. And in fact, if you look at modern debates about what is a species, you can't find anybody agreeing on what the criteria are for a species because they don't all share the same genome. We don't all share. We don't. There isn't a single human genome. There's a population of genomes, but they're variable. It's not unbounded variation, but they are variable, right? <laughs> Money, for example. What are all the physical things that make something a currency? Is there any physical feature that all the currencies in all the worlds that's ever been used by humans share? Well, certainly, right. But uh, but what what is it? Uh, is it definable? The, so th it's getting to the point that you're. There is no physical, function. There, it, it's the function, it's the right? Function. It's that we trade it for material goods, and that, and we have to agree, right? We all impose on whatever it is: salt, barley, little shells, big rocks in the ocean that can't move, Bitcoin, pieces of plastic, mortgages, which are basically a promise of something in the future, nothing more, right? All of these things we impose value on them, and we all agree that. We can exchange them for material goods. Yeah, and uh, yes, uh, that's brilliant. By the way, you're attributing some of that to Darwin that he thought. No, I'm no, I'm saying you, that 
What Because it's a brilliant did, view of what a species is, is the function. I, yeah, what I'm saying is that what Darwin, Darwin really talked about variation in, um, so if you read, for example, the biologist Ernst Mayer, who was an evolutionary biologist, and then when he retired, became a historian and philosopher of biology. And his suggestion is that Darwin, Darwin did talk about variation. He vanquished what's called essentialism, the idea that there's a single set of features that define any species. And um, out of that grew um, really discussions of the function, you know, like some of the functional features that species have, like they can reproduce, uh, off they can have offspring, the individuals of a species can have offspring. Well, it turns out that's not a perfect, uh, de you know, that's not a perfect uh, criterion to use, but it's a functional criterion, right? So what I'm saying is that in cognitive science, people came up with the idea, they discovered the idea of conceptual categories or ad hoc concepts, these concepts that can change based on the function they're serving, right? And um, uh, that it's there, Darwin, it's in Darwin, and it's also in the philosophy of social reality. You can, the way that philosophers talk about social reality, just look around you. I mean, we impose, we're treating a bunch of things as similar, which are physically... <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, physical reality still holds the trump card, right? But still, there's <laughs> the a lot of... card. Well, <laughs> the, uh, pun unintended. Uh, pun completely unintended, but there you go. That's a predicting brain yeah, for yeah. you. <laughs> um, uh, but but there's a tremendous amount of leeway. Yes. Yeah. That's the point. So uh, what but, I'm but... saying is that emotions are like money. It, <laughs> basically, they're they're like money. They're like countries. They're like... Um, kings and queens and presidents, they're like everything that we construct, that we impose meaning on. We take these physical signals and we give them meanings that um, they don't otherwise have by their physical nature. And because we agree, yeah. they have that function. But the, the, so the beautiful thing, so maybe I'll like money, I, I love this similarity is, it, it's not obvious to me that this kind of emergent agreement should happen with emotion because our experiences are so different for each of us humans, and yet we kind of converge. Well, in a culture we converge, but not across cultures. There are huge, huge differences. There are huge differences in what, what concepts exist, what, they're, um, what they look like. Um, so what I would say is that... Um, they feel like... what. What we're doing with our young children as we, uh, as their brains become wired to their physical and <laughs> concepts, that's partly what they're learning. And we curate those for infants just the way we curate for them what is a dog, what is a cat, what is a truck. We sometimes explicitly label and we sometimes just use mental words. Um, when, you know, your kid is, you know, throwing Cheerios on the floor instead of eating them, or your kid is crying when, you know, she won't put herself to sleep or whatever. You know, we use mental words and um, a word is this, words with, for infants, words are these really special things that they help infants learn abstract categories. There's a huge literature showing that children can take things that don't look infants, like infants, really young infants, pre-verbal infants, can take, if you label, if I say to you, and you're an infant, okay? So I say, Lex, Lexi, <laughs> this yeah. is a bling. Yeah. And I put it down and the bling makes a squeaky noise. Yeah. And then I say, I'm Lexi, getting excited by the way. <laughs> this is a bling. And I yeah. put it down and it makes a squeaky noise. And then I say, Lexi, this is a bling. You, as young as four months old, 
will expect this to make a noise. Yeah. A squeaky awesome. noise. And if you don't, if it Just doesn't, like you'll be surprised because it violated your expectation, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. I'm building for you an internal model of a bling. Yeah. Okay. Infants can do this really, really at a young age. And so there's no reason to believe that they couldn't learn emotion categories and concepts way. in the same way. And in in one and what happens when you go to a new culture? When you go to a new culture, you have to do what's called um, emotion acculturation. So my colleague Bacha Mesquita in Belgium studies emotion acculturation. She studies how when people move from one culture to another, how do they learn the emotion concepts of that culture? How do they learn to make sense of their own internal sensations and also the movements, you know, the raise of an eyebrow, the tilt of a head? How do they learn to make sense of cues from other people using concepts they don't have, but have to make on the fly? So there's the difference between cultures let me uh, open another door. I'm not sure I want to open, but uh, difference between men and women. Is there a um, difference between the emotional lives? Women are much more emotional than men. Okay. Okay. And then we gave them little handheld computers. These were little Hewlett Packard computers. They fit in the palm of your hand couple of pounds, they weighed a couple of pounds. So this was like pre-Palm Pilot even, like this was, you know, 1990s and like early. And um, we um, asked them, we would, you know, ping them like 10 times a day and just ask them to report how they were feeling, which is called experience sampling. So we experience sampled. And... Um, and then at the end, and then we looked at their reports, and what we found is that men and women basically didn't differ. I mean, there were some people who were really, had many more instances of emotion. So they were, you know, um, they were treading uh, water in a tumultuous sea of emotion. And then there were other people who were like floating tranquilly, you know, in a lake. Of, yeah. It was really not perturbed very often and, yeah. and everyone in between. But there were no difference between men and women. And the really interesting thing is at the end of the sampling period, we asked people, um, so re reflect over the past two weeks and tell it. So, you know, we've been now pinging people like again and again and again, right? So tell us how, how emotional do you think you are? No change from the beginning. So men and women believe that they are, they believe that they are different. And when they are looking at other people, they make different inferences about emotion. If a man, if a man is scowling, like if you and I were together and some, so somebody's watching this. Uh -huh. Okay. And, um, I yeah. Hey, who are saying? Hey, hi. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, By the um, way, people love it when you look at the camera. <laughs> um, if you and I make exactly the same set of facial movements, when people look at you, both men and women look at you, they are more likely to think, oh, he's reacting to the situation. And when they look at me, they'll say, oh, she's having an emotion. She's, yeah. you know, yeah. And I wrote about this actually um, uh, right before the 2016 election. You know what, maybe I, I could confess. Let me try to carefully confess. But you are really gonna. Yeah, that, I'm, that when I, that, that there is an element when I see Hillary Clinton that there was something annoying about her to me. And I, just that feeling, and then I tried to reduce that to, what what is that? Because I think the same attributes that are annoying about her, when I see in other people, wouldn't be annoying. So I, I was trying to understand 
What is it? Because it it certainly does feel like that concept that I've constructed in my mind. Well, I'll tell you that I think. Well, let me just say that um, that that what you would predict about, for example, the performance of the two of them in the debates, and I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times actually um, before the second debate, and it it played out really pretty much as I thought that it would, based on research. It's not like I'm like a great fortune teller or anything. It's just I was just applying the research, which was that when a woman, um, a woman's, um, people make internal attributions, it's called. They, they infer that the facial movements and body posture and vocalizations of a woman reflect her inner state. But for a man, they're more likely to assume that they reflect his response to the situation. It doesn't say anything about him. It says something about the situation he's in. That's brilliant. Now, for the thing that you are that you were describing about Hillary Clinton, um, I think a lot of people experienced, but it's also in line with research, which shows, and and particularly research actually on um, in about teaching evaluations is one place that you really see it, where. The expectation is that a woman will be nurturant hmm. and that a man, there's just no expectation for him to be hmm. nurturant. So he's, you know, if he is nurturant, he gets points. Um, if he's not, he gets points. Right. He, they're just different points, right? Whereas for a woman, especially a woman who's a, an authority figure, she's really in a catch-22. Right. Because if she's serious, she's a bitch. And if she's empathic, uh, then she's weak. Right, that's brilliant. I mean, one of the bigger questions to ask here, so that's one example where our con- construction of concepts gets, right. but gets remember, us in trouble. But, so, but remember... Like you're regulating around carbohydrates, not the protein. Yeah, but in fact, actually, what I am doing, if I am like most... Uh, animals on the planet, I am regulating around protein. So knowing this, what do I do? I correct my behavior to eat, to to actually deliberately try to focus on the protein. Mm -hmm. That, this is the idea behind bias training, right? Like if you, um, I, also did not experience Hillary Clinton as the warmest candidate. However, you can use consistent science, since the consistent scientific findings, to organize your behavior. That doesn't mean that rationality is the absence of emotion, because sometimes emotion or sent any feelings in general not the same thing as emotion. Um, that's another topic. Um, but you know, our 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 source of uh, of information and and their wisdom and helpful. So I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that if you have a deeply held belief and the evidence shows that you're wrong, then you're wrong. It doesn't really matter how confident you feel. You that confidence could be also explained by science, right? So it it would be the same thing as. If I, regardless of whether someone is a Repu- like Charlie Baker, right? Regardless of whether somebody is a Republican or a Democrat, if that person has a record that you can see is consistent with what you believe, then that is information that you can act on. Yeah, and and then so try to. I mean, this is kind of what empathy is and open mindedness is. Try to um, consider that the set of concepts that you're your brain has constructed through which you are now perceiving the world is not painting the full picture. I mean, this is now true for basically every, it doesn't have to be men and women. It could be basically the prism through which we perceive actually the political discourse, right? Absolutely. So, so here's what I would say. Um, The, you know, there are people who, scientists who will talk learn from, you know, books and movies and other people telling you about their experiences and so on. And if your brain cannot make a concept 
to make sense of those, anticipate what those sense data are and make sense of them, you will be experientially blind. So, you know, when I'm giving lectures to people, I'll show them like a blobby black and white image and they're experientially blind to the image. They, they can't see anything in it. And then I show them a photograph and then I show them the image again, the blobby image, and then they see actually an object in it. But the, <laughs> ob awesome. but the image is the same. Yeah. It's there. They're actually adding their predictions now are yeah. adding, right? Or it's a anyone beautiful who's, example. anybody who's learned a language, uh, a second language after their first language also has this experience of um, things that initially sound like sounds that they can't quite make sense of eventually come to make, they eventually come to make sense of them. And in fact, there are really cool examples of people who were like born blind um, because they have cataracts or um, they um, have corneal damage so that no light is reaching um, uh, the brain. And then they have an operation and then light reaches the brain and they can't see for days and weeks and sometimes years they have they are experientially blind to certain things so what happens with empathy right is that your brain is making a prediction and if it doesn't if it doesn't have the capacity to um make if it doesn't, if you don't share, if you're not similar, remember, you mean, you know, categories are uh, instances which are similar in some way. If you are not similar enough to that person, you will have a hard time making a prediction about what they feel. You will be experienced. It's not that the physicians are racist necessarily but they might be experientially blind. The same thing is true of male physicians with female patients. I could tell you some hair-raising stories, really, that where people die as a consequence of a physician making the wrong inference, the wrong prediction, because of being experientially blind. So. We are, you know, empathy is not, um, it's not magic. It, it's, we make inferences about each other, about what each other's feeling and thinking. In this culture, more than, there are some cultures where, you know, people have what's called opacity of mind, where they will make a prediction about someone else's actions, but they're not inferring anything about the internal state of that person. Um, but in our culture, we're constantly making inferences. What is this person thinking? What is, and we're not doing it necessarily consciously, but it's, we're just doing it really automatically using our predictions, what we know. And if you expose yourself to information, which is very different from somebody else, I mean, really what we have is we have different cultures in this, in this country right now that are, there are a number of reasons for this. I mean, part of it is, I don't know if you saw the uh, social dilemma, the, the Netflix. Um, uh, Heard about it. Yeah, it's a great, it's really great um, documentary. And- uh, About what social networks are doing to our society? Yeah, or is that, yeah, yeah. But, you know, nothing, no phenomenon has a, a simple single cause. There are multiple, small causes which all add up to a perfect storm that's that's just you know how most things work and so the fact that machine learning algorithms are serving people up information on social media that is consistent with what they've already viewed and making you know um uh, is part of the reason that you have these silos but it's not the only reason why you have these silos? I think there are other there are other things afoot that uh, enhance um, people's inability to 
even have a decent conversation. Yeah, I mean, okay, so, so many things you said are just brilliant. So the experiment, experiential blindness, but also from my perspective, like I, I preach and I try to practice empathy a lot. And something about the way you've explained it makes me almost see it as a kind of exercise that we should all do, like to train, like to add experiences to the brain to expand its capacity to predict more effectively. Absolutely. So, so like what, what, like what I do is kind of like a method acting thing, which is I imagine what the life of a person is like, you know, just think. I mean, this is something you see with Black Lives Matter and uh, police officers. It feels like they're both, uh, not both, but I have, because of martial arts and so on, I have a lot of friends who are cops. <laughs> they don't necessarily um, have empathy or visualize the experience of the other. Certainly, currently, unfortunately, people aren't doing that with police officers. They're not imagining, they're not empathizing or putting them. Three and a half years since How Emotions Are Made came out and I'm still receiving daily emails from people, right? So that's gratifying. But one of the most gratifying emails I received was from a police officer in Texas who told me that he thought that How Emotions Are Made um, contained information that would be really helpful to resolving some of these difficulties. And he hadn't even read my op-ed piece about when is a gun not a gun and, you know, like using the what we know about the science of perception from predict, from a prediction standpoint, like the brain is a predictor, to understand a little differently what might be happening in these circumstances. So there's there's a real, what's hard about, it's hard to talk about because everyone gets mad at you when you talk <laughs> about this. Like, you know, and um, there is a way to understand this which has profound empathy for the suffering of people of color and that, definitely is in line with Black Lives Matter at the same time as understanding the really difficult situation that police officers find themselves in. And I'm not talking about this bad apple or that bad apple. I'm not talking about police officers who are necessarily shooting people in the back as they run away. I'm talking about the cases of really good, well-meaning cops who have the kind of predicting brain that everybody else has, they're in a really difficult situation that I think both they and the people who are harmed don't realize. Like they just, the, the way that these situations are constructed, I think it's just, there's a lot to be said there, I guess, is, yeah. is, is what, what I want to say. Is there something we can try to say in, in a sense, like what, what I'm, from the perspective of the predictive brain, which is a, a, a fascinating perspective uh, to take on this, you know, the all the protests that are going on, there seems to be a concept of a police officer being built. No, I, the, think, that poli I think that concept is there. But it's is gaining strength, so it's being re. Um, I mean, yeah, it is sure. Yeah, it, it for is sure. There. But it, I think, yeah, for sure. I think that that's right. I think that there's um there's a shift in the stereotype of what I would say is a stereotype. There's a stereotype of of a uh, black man in this country that's always in movies and television. Not always, but like largely. Um, uh, that many people watch. I mean, you know, right. the, you, the, you think you're watching a 10 o'clock drama and all you're doing is like kicking back and relaxing, but actually you're having certain predictions reinforced and others not. And what's happening, yeah. what's happening now with police is the same thing, um, that there are certain stereotypes of a police officer 
that are being abandoned and other stereotypes that are being reinforced by by what you see happening. All I'll say is that if you remember, I mean, there's a lot to say about this, really, that, you know, regardless of whether it makes people mad or not, I mean, I just, I th the science is what it is. Yeah. Um, it, it, just remember what I said, the brain is, makes predictions about internal changes in the body first, and then motor, it starts to prepare motor action. And then it makes a prediction about what you will see and hear. Brain's ability to sample what's out there mm -hmm. is yoked to your heart rate. It's yoked to your heartbeats. There are certain phases of the heartbeat where it's easier for you to see what's happening in the world than at others. <laughs> and so thing. if your heart rate goes through the roof, you will be less let you will be more likely to just go with your prediction and not correct based on what you what, what's out there because you're actually literally not seeing as well or you will see things that aren't there basically is there something that we could say in the, by way of advice for when this episode is released in the in the chaos of uh, emotion, sorry, I don't know a better term, that's just flying around on social media. What's um... well, I actually think it is it is emotion in the following sense, you know, and, and it sounds a little bit like it sounds a little bit like artificial when I in the way that I'm about to say it, but I really think that this is what's happening. You know, one thing we haven't talked about is, you know, brains evolved, didn't evolve for you to see, they didn't evolve for you to hear, they didn't evolve for you to feel, they evolved to control your body. That's why you have a brain. You have a brain so that it can control your body. And the metaphor, the, the, there's a, the scientific term for predictively controlling your body is allostasis. Your brain is making, um, is attempting to it's tempting to anticipate the needs of your body and meet those needs before they arise so that you can act as you need to act. And the metaphor that I use is a body budget. You know, your brain is running a budget for your body. It's not budgeting money, it's budgeting glucose and salt. When your brain, when things are chaotic, you can't predict what's going to happen next. So I have this absolutely brilliant scientist working in my lab. His name is um, Jordan uh, Terrio, and he's published this really terrific paper on um, a sense of should. Like, why do we have social rules? Why do we, um, you know, uh, adhere to social norms? It's because if I make myself predictable to you, then you are predictable to me. And if you're predictable to me, that's good because that, that is less metabolically expensive for me. Novelty or unpredictability at the extreme is expensive. And if it goes on for long enough, and you are experiencing arousal because the chemicals that help you learn increase your feeling of arousal, basically. Mm -hmm. But if it goes on for long enough, you will become depleted. And you will start to feel really, really, really distressed. So what we have is a culture full of people right now who are, their body budgets are <laughs> just decimated. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. When you talk about it as depression and anxiety, it makes you think that it's not about your metabolism, that it's not about your body budgeting, that it's not about getting enough sleep or about eating well or about making sure that you have social connections. Um, it's, you know, it's, you think that it's something separate from that. But depression and anxiety are just a way of being in the world. They're a way of being in the world 
when things aren't quite right with your predictions? That's such a deep way of thinking. Like the the brain is uh, maintaining homeostasis. It's actually allostasis. Allostasis. But, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's constantly making predictions, and metabolically speaking, it's very costly to make novel, like constantly be learning to making adjustments. And then over time, there's you know there's a uh, cost. It is something I talk about in my in the book in Seven and a Half Lessons about the brain. I think it's really important. It, it's hard, but it's hard. I think it's you know. It, it's hard for people to have, to be curious about views that are unlike their own um, when, um, when they feel so encumbered. And I'll just tell you, I had this epiphany, really. Um, I was listening to uh, Robert Reich's um, The System. He was talking about oligarchy versus democracy. So oligarchy is where very wealthy people, like extremely wealthy people, um, shift power so that they become even more wealthy and even more insulated and from the, you know, the pressures of the common person. Um, it's actually the kind of system that um, leads to the collapse of civilizations, if you believe Jared Diamond. Mm -hmm. Just say that. But anyways, I'm listening to this and I'm listening to him describe in fairly decent detail how the CEOs of these companies, uh, uh, there's been a shift in what it means to be a CEO and not, not being, no longer being a steward of the community and so on. But like in the 1980s, it sort of shifted to this other model of being like an oligarch. And he's talking about how you know, it used to be the case that um, that CEOs uh, made like twenty times uh, what their um, their employees made, and now they make about three hundred times on average what their employees made. So, where did that money come from? It came from the pockets of the employees, and they don't they don't know about it, right? No one knows about it. They just know they can't feed their children. That's why you experience what you're experiencing. And just for a minute, I was thinking, I had deep empathy for people who have beliefs that are really, really, really different from mine. But I was trying really hard to see it through their eyes. Yeah. And did it cost me something metabolically? I'm sure. I'm sure. But, I'm, but you had something in the gas tank. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> in order to allocate that. I well, mean, that's the question is like, where did you... you draw, what resources did your brain yeah. draw on in order to actually make that effort? Well, I'll tell you something, honestly, Lex. I don't have that much in the gas tank right now. <laughs> right? So uh, I, I am surfing the stress that, you know, stress is just, what is stress? Stress is your brain is preparing for a big metabolic outlay and it just keeps preparing and preparing and preparing and preparing. You as a professor, you as a human? Both, right? It's a, For me, this is a moment of existential crisis as much as anybody else, democracy, all of these things. So uh, in many of my roles, so I'm, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, um, I get up every morning and I exercise. I run, yeah. I row, I lift weights, right? You exercise in the middle of the day. Yeah. I saw your like, yeah. you know, daily I'm thing. obsessed with it. Yeah. I hate it, actually. Yeah. You love it, right? You get a... No, I hate it. I yeah. hate it, but yeah. I do it religiously. Yeah. Why? Because it's a really good investment. It's an expenditure that is a really good investment. And so when I was exercising, I was listening to the book. And when I realized the insights that I was sort of like playing around with, like, is this, does this make sense? Does this make sense? 
I didn't immediately plunge into it. I basically wrote some stuff down. I set it aside. And then I did what I... I Lots of different things. It can mean talking to a friend about it. It can mean... Um, you know, it can, it can mean get, making sure you get a good night's sleep before you do it. It can mean lots of different things, but I, I guess I, I think we have to do these things. I, uh, yeah, uh, this, I'm going to re-listen to this conversation several times. This is brilliant. Uh, but I do, I do think about, you know, I've encountered so many people that can't possibly imagine. Brains not willing to invest the resources to empathize with the other side. And I think you have to, in order to be able to, like, to see the obvious common humanity in us. I don't know what the system is that's creating this division, we can put it at the, like you said, it's a perfect storm. It might be the social media, it might be, I don't know what the hell it is. I think is. it's a bunch of things. Right. I think it's, it just comes there's, together. there's an economic system which is disadvantaging yep. large numbers of people. There's a, a use of social media. Like if you, you know, if I had to orchestrate or architect a system that would screw up a human body budget, it would be the one that we live in. You know, we don't sleep enough. We eat pseudo food, basically. Um, we are on social media too much, which is full of ambiguity, which is really... Not everything is reducible to metabolism, but there, if you combine all these things together... It's helpful to think of it that way. Then uh, Somehow it's also... Uh... Uh, somehow it reduces the entirety of the human experience to the same kind of obvious logic. Like we should exercise every day in the same kind of way. We should uh, we should empathize every day. Yeah, you know there are these really wonderful wonderful programs for um, for teens and um, sometimes also for parents of people who've lost children in in wars and in conflicts in political conflicts where they go to a bucolic setting and they talk to each other about their experiences. And um, miraculous things happen, you know? So, um, uh, you know, it, it's easy to, uh, it's easy to sort of shrug this stuff off as kind of Pollyanna-ish, you know, like what's this really gonna do? But, um, you have to think about when my daughter went to college, I, I, I gave her advice. I said, uh, try to be around people who let you be the kind of person you want to be. Right. You were back to free will. You have a choice. You have a choice. It might seem like a really hard choice. It might seem like an unimaginably difficult choice. But you have a choice. Do you want to be somebody who in, is wrapped in, in fury and agony? This is the Lex Free Podcast.